I just, I looked at my life and I thought I, I, I can't go down, like, you know, be on my deathbed and think about how many things I put in a landfill. I really want to teach people about quality, proper investment and like doing beautiful work that feels worthy. And my design firm was getting increasingly high end and that was much more aligned with my values. So it, it, I do follow my values even more than my ambition. Hi everyone, I'm your host, Karen Bond, founder and creative director of House of Bond, the interior design studio in Vancouver. Over the past 15 years of running my firm, I've learned a thing or two of what makes a creative business successful. Everything from operations to sales to marketing. I mentioned that I have a Netflix show, right? Well, I've always said that in order to grow professionally, you have to grow personally. Leveling up requires pushing past your comfort zone, taking risks, and sometimes making mistakes. This podcast covers all of the above. I talk to inspiring entrepreneurs and prolific creatives about their own business journeys. These stories include acts of courage, moments of self-discovery, failures, victories, and all the learning in between. My goal with this podcast is to build community and serve you by providing advice, insight, and aha moments that you can apply to your own business and life. Take what speaks to you and leave the rest, but join me on this journey and welcome to my show. Welcome back to the podcast, everyone. I am especially excited about today's guest because I have Miss Kelly Deck with me, a interior designer in Vancouver who founded her company, Kelly Deck Designs, many, many years ago. She is a former host of the HGTV show, Take It Outside, Mm -hmm. and has grown and built an amazing portfolio and brand really in Vancouver. Thank you. We were talking earlier, uh, me and the production team, we're talking earlier about how your name, Kelly Deck, just seems so synonymous with West Coast design. Thank you. So it's an honor for me to have you here, and I'm really excited about today's conversation. Me too. Okay. Well, let's get started. I would love to start with when you started your business and how you kind of got off the ground. Well, it really kind of started a little haphazardly. I I had planned to go to – I graduated from Emily Carr with my fine arts degree, and – I had intended to go off to Ryerson to do interior design, but I, it's a long story, but I I ended up opening this store on Main Street instead. And it felt very serendipitous and right at the time. And the idea was to be producing homewares because I was trained in painting, ceramics, sculpture, and I'd studied in the UK extensively for ceramics. So I had my ceramic studio in-house. I had this little tiny store up front and I would collaborate with artisans in creating homewares every season uh, for a look. And so it was kind of way ahead of its time. That was in 2002. And um, it eventually kind of morphed into people asking me to decorate their homes, which morphed into me um, building a design firm. And then I I got the HGTV television series kind of uh, at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, so fun fact for everyone listening or watching, I worked with Kelly for yeah. a few months. For a few months, I, yeah. I was fresh out of design school. Yes. Well, the little stint of design school that I did, because I am a design school dropout. So the little stint of design school that I did, um, I was fresh out of school. I worked with Kelly for a few months. And at the time, you had your studio in Gastown and you were also doing the show. And I think you were... Yes maybe in the second or third season of the show? Maybe the second. Okay. Yeah, maybe the second season. So how did the show come about? Well, the show was really a funny thing. Like what happened was I was out with Susie Wall. Susie's a, you know, personality here in Vancouver and her boyfriend, with my boyfriend at the time, we were all having dinner together and she asked me what I wanted out of my career. I had the store, I just started it. And I guess I was at sort of at the tail end of it and which was only a few years. And she said, well, what do you really want to do? And I was like, oh, well, I really want to design homewares. I want to do dishware. I want to do um, plateware. I want to do linens, wallpapers. And she was like, well, what do you think you need to do to do that? And I I literally dropped it as a joke. I said, I don't know, get a television series. And a few weeks later, Susie put my name forward 
for a casting call that came out for HGTV. And she did that. And then two other people in the press did it. And they were people I helped out with like gift giving ideas and decorating ideas. And they just put my name forward. But being on television was never a personal aspiration of mine. That's so wild. It almost seems like that was very serendipitous then or almost meant to happen that you would have a TV show. I kind of feel like if if you're in the flow of life that amazing opportunities come across your path and it's just like something energetic that happens and it's beautiful and you just have to say yes. Yeah. And that's kind of what happened. And it was it was amazing, you know, three seasons. It was so hard. And then I started writing for the Globe and Mail. So I was doing that every week as well and then running the firm. Um, And it catapulted my career. Well, I was going to ask because I think that's an amazing way to start. I mean, the marketing that would have come with doing the HGTV show and then also the timing of that because at that time, so that would have been 2005 2005 to 2010 was kind of like when it was all happening. And I feel like that was a period when everybody was watching HGTV. It's true. Or at least I, I was watching HGTV all the time then. And so getting a show on HGTV was probably, I'm assuming, probably instant marketing. It was instant marketing. But the interesting thing that happened was that, like at the time we called the company, we hadn't called it Kelly Deck Design yet. It was Simple Design Group. And so Simple Design Group was growing its own business. And then, you know, Take It Outside was filming because we were, you know, one of the younger shows on the network. And Sarah's show was very popular and Candace's Mm -hmm. show was very popular. And so we were just kind of coming up the ranks. Um, and then there was this critical point that I could see that that tipping point was going to happen. And I was doing like the home and garden shows. And so I changed the name of the company, um, and named it after myself at that point. And, and then yes, there was this tipping point that happened and it all sort of like, you know, blew up essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, um, I had a glimpse of what your schedule was like at the time too. And it was crazy because um, you were filming, the seasons were pretty condensed, I think, like the filming, the production and filming schedule was intense. Very. You were producing designs for the show. That's right. And then you were also hosting. Yes. And running the firm. So I had like six staff at that point and a pretty decent roster of projects. And so basically what my day looked like was I would get up at five, I'd run my lines, I'd do my hair, I'd get to set at seven. And then we would like, we'd shoot till five at lunch. I would call the firm. I'd have meetings like in that one hour before we started shooting again. At five, I'd go home and work for like four hours responding to email, like looking at designs, redlining things and sending them back to my staff. And then on the weekends, I would, um, I'd write all weekend for the Globe and Mail because I had a column that came out every single week. Yes. I remember that. Yeah. That is so insane. It's so intense. Yeah. And it came to a boiling point. It came to a point that I couldn't do it all anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I relate to you because when I went to film Restaurants on the Edge, I was on the road for seven months. Mm -hmm. We were juggling 20 projects at the time. I had, just before going on the road, I had hired a GM to run the studio while I was away. And it was the exact same thing. I would get up early, do my hair and makeup, film, depending on where I was. And if I got back, like offset and back to my hotel room and it was still business hours, then I would order room service and be on my phone and on Zoom until five or six o'clock and then do it all over again. Yeah. And I, like, I it's just relentless. It's relentless. And I'll be honest, like I lived on coffee, red wine and sleeping pills. <laughs> yeah. Like literally. Oh, no. Yeah. 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 It was just like the only way to kind of get it all done. And there's just a critical point that I was, I just didn't want to do it anymore. And in that moment, so when you're running that hard, were you also of that mindset that you had started this business and you really wanted to get it off the ground and you were doing the hustle that you felt like you needed to do at the time to really make a name for yourself. Is that kind of the mindset that you were in or? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I don't think so. I don't think that's kind of how my brain works, oddly enough. Um, it's really about like what I love like I, but I am always strategically thinking about my company so I am very ambitious I don't want to try to imply that I'm not I I am um but I was really in 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 that time I don't know 
And I asked that question because... No, it's a great question. I just like, I really have to stop and think about it. Was I? I guess so. In some ways, I felt pressure. I felt a lot of pressure to please everybody. But then I just had this critical point that actually I realized that my desires for my company were divergent from what I could get from HGTV. Mm -hmm. And it was a different audience. It was a suburban audience. And I felt a lot of pressure from uh, Alliance Atlanta, who was the production company at the time, to use really mediocre products, you know, so that they could get their ad dollars. And I get it. But there there would be, say, like a, a fireplace that was $200 at some local retailer, and they wanted me to use it. And it was landfill. And I I just, I looked at my life and I thought, I, I, I can't go down, like, you know, be on my deathbed and think about how many things I put in a landfill. I really want to teach people about quality, proper investment, and like doing beautiful work that feels worthy. And my design firm was getting increasingly high end and that was much more aligned with my values. So it, it, I do follow my values even more than my ambition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is amazing and amazing, an amazing quality because I think in doing that you stay in fierce alignment with yourself. It's really easy in a situation like that to compromise maybe on your values or, um, for the notoriety or for the fame or for the marketing or for whatever reason. Uh, but I do think that being in alignment with yourself is a way that at least I've experienced it. And this is my own learning lesson. Um, that leads you to true like happiness and peace, right? Uh, absolutely. I, I feel like that is kind of how I blaze my path is my values are so intense at times that I've turned down things that like if I, if I made you a list of the things I've turned down and the other people who have taken those opportunities and the incredible amounts of money that they have made, um, you know, and, and power to them, I couldn't do it. I couldn't take this endorsement deal with, you know, there was an endorsement deal with Wayfair and all sorts of things and, and so many more. Yeah. Uh, and I, I've said no to all of them because I just don't think I can endorse things that I don't believe in. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Can you say what some of your values are? Quality would be one of my highest values. I I love quality and craftsmanship. And so I, I, I'm i always like in pursuit of that, whether it's in my personal time, I love like actual handcraft. So I travel all over the world looking for beautiful handcrafts. Um, and, and then when I'm like, when I'm in my work, it's something that I'm very committed to. And I'm always trying to figure out how to get the best quality and craftsmanship within the parameters that I've been given. Um, so I would say that is one of them. And then like, I'm, very transparent mm-hmm. and uh, at moments to the detriment of my business. But I also just want to have a really transparent and open conversation with people. And I need to, I need to be in front of my client and feel that I'm in integrity. Mm-hmm. And that's part of it for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is so beautifully said. Um, just really, really beautifully said. And I think that being really uh, having your values be a pillar in your company, in your practice, and in be. your life, yeah. helps the probably the whole team also be in alignment. Have you like woven your values into the company, oh, and yeah. and was that from the very beginning, or was that like a learned process for you? I would say it was from the very beginning, but of course, like as you evolve as an entrepreneur, you start to obtain more til- more skills, and you spend more time with other entrepreneurs, and so of course. Um, eventually we really cultivated and, you know, solidified our values. And it's very much a part of the culture of Kelly Deck Design today. Like so much so that we're actually working on this like new brand, this other thing that we're doing. And it was fun to do the mission, vision, values exercise with the team. Because I love to be like, have them all involved. And I I like to co-create. I'm a co-creator. And um, they were like, it was really cute because they were trying to, they, like quality, of course, was very important, but they also wanted timelessness to be, which is one of our values at Kelly Deck Design. And, and they, 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 they said timelessness. And then I, and I said, but is it? Mm-hmm. Because it's a product-based business. And it, timelessness is not actually a part of this brand. And it was really interesting because they've been, they've been so socialized in the values of Kelly Deck Design that it took them a few minutes to kind of get out of that space and get into the ideation of this new brand that will breathe new life into and be its own entity that's still aligned with our like, you know, essential values, but will have its own values which govern the decision making of that company. Um, and it was kind of a cool exercise because it showed how well we, we'd actually got them to, you know, 
get on board for them in Kelly Dac Design. They eat, sleep, and breathe them. Yeah. 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 Uh, can you talk a little bit about the new brand? Ooh, or is it I'm too early? Little, it's a little early. Okay. We, we have like a couple things. Thing, we are coming out with one product in particular in the next year, mm-hmm. but I'm just not there yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's yeah, very exciting. Yeah. Really exciting. Yeah. Um, and for you, were you, was it your aspiration to be an interior designer? Did you have that growing up that you always wanted to go into design or is that something, a path that sort of found you? I would say, yes, it's always been there. And I probably realized when I was in art school that I wanted to be an interior designer. My dad was a mechanical engineer and I spent a lot of time looking at houses on weekends with him. My parents were always very fascinated with like home construction and renovating and like that whole industry. And I think my dad really, if he, you know, had the opportunity to have an education, would have done architecture. So that's so funny. That's like my dad too. He was a doctor, but if he were to do it again, he would have been an architect. Yeah. It's I think a lot of people don't choose that path, but they want it. So I think it was always in my blood and both of my parents were quite creative. And then I realized when I was in art school that I wanted to make things for the home and objects for the home. And then that involved into me realizing that if I wanted to make the objects, then I needed to actually create the spaces. And so it kind of was like something that evolved over time. And I think at the time that I was growing up, we didn't fully understand what an interior designer did. Oh, for sure. There's so much more out there yes, today. Yes, there's so much more out there. Like even when I went to design school, it was a fluke that I had found out that that was even an option. I remember I had graduated from university. I had done an arts degree um, at UBC and I was still at a serving job. And one of the girls who was also a server said, oh yeah, I'm, I'm doing some design course, interior design courses. And I was like, interior design? What what is that? Is and I literally said, but is that like paint and fabric? <laughs> yeah. Because that's what people think that's it is. That's what people think often. it is. Yeah. That's what people even think still it is. today. Even still today. Yeah. Even still today. Do you find that on that note, with the brand and the clientele that you've built up, do you find that there's still quite a bit of an education process that happens with the type of work that you do? Or do you feel like you've evolved a little bit past that point? No, there's always education for sure. There's always education and different ranges of it depending on the the clients. Anyone who chooses to sign a retainer check with me uh, has a deep appreciation for what design is. So by the time we've got through that process, most people, if they're just at the beginning of that journey, um, they won't understand my fee structure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. They won't see the value. Yeah. Yeah. Which Because it is a huge investment. Mm-hmm. And to do interior design well and to execute a project well, there's a very high level of time and detail and attention that goes not in not only into the design but also the drawing set and then into the execution of a it's project huge. it's huge it's huge um could you talk a little bit more about your process yeah sure i mean we have an incredible team at kelly deck design and i really act as like the creative director of that team but they're all great creatives in their own right there's 14 of us mm-hmm. so it's a big team and we like From the beginning, I mean, I spend an enormous amount of time with the architects, uh, developing the floor plan, developing the interior architecture right from the get-go of the project. And it's not uncommon as we develop relationships with clients, if they're coming back for their second project, for me to be the person recruiting the architect and the builder. So I often like act as a bit of a prime Mm -hmm. uh, on the project, which is kind of unusual for interior design. Mm -hmm. Um, But it doesn't surprise me because when it's done really well, I think the, the, the marriage between the interior designer and the architecture needs, or or the architect needs to be a really great partnership. Yes. And I think that there's actually so much that interior design, interior designers know about a project that it it doesn't surprise me that you would act as that person. Yeah. I mean, I think how our careers evolved, like how my career has evolved over time and our team's expertise is like, we're really construction experts. Mm-hmm. We're really, I can hold my own on a pretty big site yeah. and so can most of my team. And so at that point, it, it's not uncommon for us to actually have a more holistic perspective on the project than the architect might, because we're involved on the ground a great deal more on mm-hmm. a daily basis. So then I think that it's just kind of a natural progression. So 
once we've got through the floor plans with the client and we obviously you have a clear idea of their vision around that time as well because you've looked mm -hmm. at lots of images with them usually i've gotten to know their family quite well um, it's not uncommon for our clients to have like multiple homes and and many children mm -hmm. so most of my clients have at least three if not five or six children and that's why they're building very big homes um, and so once we've kind of really got a clear vision about what they want and we've locked down those floor plans, then we move into doing a really beautiful concept presentation. And we call that a moment of truth inside of our company. And it's, it's, we have a few of them. Ooh, I love that. And yeah, it's great. Why? John, what is John Spence, if you okay. want to read a great book. Anyone who has a business, John Spence, awesomely simple. He talks about the importance of moments of truth. Okay, cool. And so you like, so we have moments of truth inside of the company, and one of ours is the concept presentation. That's the moment that your client knows whether or not you hurt them. Yes. It's whether or not they feel understood. And like you're either going to have big investment or you're not, but you need to have that big investment because now you have a long haul ahead of you and it's less glamorous mm -hmm. from there, right? Ooh, I love the way, like I just got shivers and goosebumps while you're saying that. I love the way that you've just articulated it and you've done it in such a concise way, just calling it a moment of truth because, I, and I've always said this to my team too, if the client has buy-in at that concept stage, the rest of it can be smooth sailing. Yeah. I mean, of course, there's the heavy lifting that comes with it, but if the client does not have buy-in, then that leads to potentially micromanaging, distrust. Absolutely. It, it is that concept presentation is the moment where you can build a huge amount of trust with the client. Or you can lose it and then you have to regain it and it's tricky. It's tricky. It's, it's tricky. very difficult. Yeah. 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 And we call that a client breakdown. So then right. we have like a whole process for what happens if that happens. We mm -hmm. don't have it happen very often, but I would say maybe once annually, mm -hmm. we have something that misfired. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something that we missed along the way. And then I say to the team, it's an opportunity. This is your opportunity to dig in and prove how committed you are mm -hmm. but you've got to kill it yeah yeah like you have to come back tenfold yeah, yeah yeah exactly yeah um so once we've got that concept presentation out of the way and that usually involves beautiful renderings and um like like critical elements we always do key spaces that we can tell the clients emotionally attached to mm -hmm. um i usually also tackle an area that's really hard mm -hmm. you know something that's got some some big complexity in how the id needs to work and that's actually gonna like kind of roll out across the project. Mm -hmm. So that often will get incorporated. And then once that's done, then we have uh, a fixed number of submission dates to go through the full design for the house. Yeah. And then- And, and before you get there, for the concept presentation in that concept phase, are you driving that quite a bit? Or how? what is your own personal process in terms of being a creative director in that phase? Um, I fall in love with each house and because I spend so much time at that early architecture phase with the client and the architect, I usually do sit down with like the lead designer and I, I'm very careful about who I assign to what and it's based on personality and style and um, there's so many things go into which lead I choose for which project and then that lead and I collaborate very closely mm -hmm. and it depends on who it is, uh, how I will approach it, the creative. Uh, but usually I collect a series of images. I might, might pull things from my own archive, from my own travels. And then we kind of create this, we start inside of a document and we create a vision and a vessel and we use particular words. And then that kind of creates the vessel for which we are moving within and what we will, the boundaries that we will not cross mm -hmm. in the design, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then we kind of just go from there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you said that your team is for you your team of 14 right yes. now. What is the breakdown of your team? Like um senior designers, juniors? Um, okay, so well I have it like it's actually broken down into departments. Okay. So there's like I now have okay, I have a what I call architectural interiors mm -hmm. division. And then I have a decor and furnishings division. So that the decor and furnishings division has a director. So she's directing and we're growing that side of the company. And then on the architectural interior side, I have two kind of sub teams. I have my traditional, like we're like pretty much 75% traditional homes inside of our firm. So there are three people plus CAD tech working on that. And two of them, one's senior, one's intermediate, one's moving her way into what I call designer because you don't jump in my firm from junior to inter intermediate. You go from junior, designer, intermediate, 
senior. So she's in a designer position. And now we're hiring probably for one or two juniors in that department. And then the decorating department has a procurement, uh, like a procurement officer, the director, and two decorators. And we're hiring another person in that department. Yeah. And then there's finance. That's Fern. And we run the company together for 15 years. Wow. And, and very cool. Yeah. Yeah. The What I love about um, you is not having come from an interior design firm. Yes where the structure is sort of set, right? And there's systems yeah. and processes that you can just take and, you know, take what you want, leave the rest mm -hmm. and build out your own company that way. I think you and I are very similar in that building our companies and brands has been a lot of intuition, gut feel, and what's really worked for you as the leader and the owner of the company. And so mm -hmm. I love hearing your breakdown because I, I'm making an assumption here that it works really well for your working style and the type of clients and work that you bring on. Absolutely. Yeah. I found that specialization was really important on, on in our firm because of the scale of the projects we work on. It's impossible for one designer to be, you know, a specialist in minimalist minimalism and essentially maximalism. Like that that's very difficult. Um and, and to you know, to be doing two of those, at, like one of each of those at the same time, is much more difficult than doing two traditional homes at the same time. So it just, I, I found that, and they have more passion for that. So it just made more sense to divide the team that way. Uh, and the same with furnishings and decor. Like furnishings and decor are so underappreciated in the industry, and the expertise that are required to do it. If I mean, we're working on multi-million-dollar estates, and there's a certain level of expectation of the caliber of what's going to be in there that's a whole area of expertise of its own oh for sure so like for my, sure that team is dedicated to learning the art of furnishing and decor mm -hmm. um and so but they all work collectively mm -hmm. as a team together so this structure that you have inside how who does the training and how did because that's a big job i mm -hmm. think to um and you must also have team members that have been with you for a little while um, and have kind of settled into, I'm assuming, I'm making a total assumption we, here. We have a very low turnover at Kelly Duck Design. Mm -hmm. And so that is a huge part of it. And we train from within. Mm -hmm. I generally don't hire senior people because they, um, and I, I, I you can say it with a grain of salt because I, I yeah, continue. It's, <laughs> it's, it's like anything, like our firm, even the most senior person that has come to us from a great firm has taken 18 months to get to the point of being able to manage the load, manage the level level of technical detail, and understand how big a role we pay, play in the coordination with the consultants. So it's better if we train from within than it is if we uh, try to hire higher in. So that's how our training program is. You essentially start as a junior at Kelly Deck Design and you work your way up. It takes five years. Mm -hmm. And at the point that you're at like say five years, now you've got, you know, your first 10,000 square foot home with like accessory building and like you've got your estate, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and, but it, it takes five years to get to the point of even be able to, to have the bandwidth to oh, do that. Oh, for sure. Oh, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And I love that you kind of, it sounds like you also set that expectation too for anyone that's coming in. Absolutely. You're, you're not going to come in as a junior and then and, you know, within two years, boom, you're going to be working on X, Y, Z because it, you, the experience, it just, the work demands that you need that kind of experience. That's it. Like we recruit very carefully, you know, the old adage, hire slowly, fire quickly. Mm -hmm. um, we rec recruit very slowly because whoever we bring on, we want to know that they're the type of person that's invested. Mm -hmm. um, they're not there for like a quick, like the, getting Kelly Duck design on their resume and out the door they go. That person typically, even if we do make the mistake of hiring that person, lasts about six weeks. The team just like instantly weeds them out. Yeah. It, it just doesn't last. Yeah. 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 I'm really inspired by what you're saying uh, about the structure of your team because when I just recently went through a downsize and at the height, we were 13 people. And this was right after I was coming off of the Netflix show and being on the road for mm -hmm. these seven months. And we were taking on a lot of projects and growing. And um, I was bringing in team members at more of a senior level, project managers, seniors. And my 
style, at least at the time, it was a very hands-off leader. Like I expect a high amount of communication, but I can be hands-off was sort of my mindset. Mm -hmm. And what I found... How'd that go for you? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Kelly's laughing. Is, Kelly's laughing is pretty she, tough in design. It's very tough in design. Mm -hmm. And what I found was after coming home and like settling it back in after being on the road, my job was cleanup queen. <laughs> yeah. And I was going in and cleaning up problems and it just felt like week after week, as soon as I had put one to bed, another one would show up on another project. Yeah. And it was just exhausting. And I found that the culture really suffered. Yes. My personal and mental health <laughs> was just really suffering because that's not the job that I wanted to be doing. That alone felt relentless that I was showing up to work all the time and it was like, okay, now what? Now we have I have to fix this. Um and I I had to take a good hard look at where I was at and where the team was at and the kind of work that we were producing and it just wasn't it was really disappointing. Like I went through a, a period of time where I was almost disappointed in myself and I just felt like after spending all of this time and energy and effort building a brand and building a company and being able to secure these clients, land these clients in these projects in the first place, I had to take a look at where the business was at and then I just decided to uh, downsize. And that was a really hard de decision because as an entrepreneur and a business owner, as I'm sure you know or have experienced on your own, it's all about growth. It's all about which I think is kind of like, to be honest, I, I think that that's, I feel like it's a little bit of like a disease that entrepreneurs suffer from in a way, like especially if you're like, I used to be in the entrepreneurs organization, which is a great organization. It's predominantly male. So I was like one of 10% women in the organization. And it was incredible for many things for my business. But where I found that there was a real disconnect between me and the kind of general ethos of most of the people there was this growth, 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 growth. And to me, like it's ego in a way. Totally. A lot of it's about how big your firm is, what big and, – and really at the end of the day, you probably aren't making more money. You probably haven't got great relationships with your team, which is the most important thing in the world. And you're probably not cranking out projects that are as great as you want them to be because you cannot. I think like that's the lie for, uh, for entrepreneurs is that growth is a solution for every business because I don't think that it is. It, I think the push for growth often puts aside the importance of intention and values and really looking at like, what do I want out of my life and why am I doing this? And like, yes, you need a certain level of scale to get to a certain type of project, but you don't have to get there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask yourself, do you want that? Like I've spoken with designers and they're like, I, you know, I want what you, you have. And I, at moments I'm like, really? Like, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure? Because like 25 to 38, pretty much like I didn't go to Whistler and party with my friends. I didn't do all the things that my friends did in their twenties and thirties. I worked 80 hours a week to build my firm, to build my, to build what I have today. And I love what I have today, but you have to ask yourself, do you want to give up those things that I, that I chose not to have? And for me, it was fine, but I don't think most people are actually wired for it. Ooh, I love that what you're saying. And it's a little bit of a reminder for maybe people who are listening or watching. Just the the reminder is just the amount of hard work and dedication and commitment and perseverance it requires to build a business, any business. But I think an interior design business is actually a very unique business. I agree. Because of the demand that's just inherent with that business. And I've struggled with that. Um, I don't know if you have, but in my entrepreneurial journey, I have struggled with just the, the requirement of time, energy, and sometimes on weekends when you want to get away or in the evening when you want to shut off or whatever – it's just not possible to do that sometimes because of whatever's going on in, in the business or a project or a client. It's just not possible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it starts and stops with you when you own a company. This is the thing. Like being an interior designer is distinct from being the owner of an interior design company. 
And if you're the owner of an interior design company, then you have this whole other layer of responsibility um, to clients, to your staff. And uh, absolutely. I mean, we're in a really sweet spot right now at Kelly Doc Design that I'm very grateful for. So it's been a, a nice journey these last couple of years. But we've had times where it wasn't as easy and there were like lots of late nights and lots of pushing hard and lots of red in the, you know, in the cash flow sheets and um, wondering whether or not we were going to make it. Mm -hmm. You know, we've had those times. Mm -hmm. And those are times that you don't go to sleep easily. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're consumed mentally by your worry. Yeah. Yeah. You're consumed mentally by your worry. But then you also, so you have the whole business side. You're looking at the PL sheets. Mm -hmm. You've got the whole finances that you're taking care of. But then you also are leading a team. Yeah. So you've got this whole leadership and HR component. And you're also hands on with projects and the amount of coordination that's required for a project, whether it's the furniture, the other consultants, the drawings, it's, it's intense. It's, it's in no joke. <laughs> it's intense. And that's like why I feel so blessed to have the team that I have now. And most of them, like if I just like sit and ruminate for a moment, like a lot of my team has been with me for, we had a turnover about seven years ago. And then most of the team I have today has been with me for about seven years. Nicole just left and started her own firm. She was with me for 15 years. We're wow. still really close friends. She's still partnered on two projects with us. Um, and then a lot of my other team have been there for about two or three. Uh, and I do find that like we, we've grown slower and we've trained from within. So because we have this really tight culture, these really clear moments of truth, a really clear process, um, the management is le like, it's still demanding, but the management is less demanding of me than what it was three or four years. Cause we kind of like got really focused on our house how yeah. our house ran, how our people, how happy our people were, you know, and because I got focused on that as a leader and focused on myself and my own well-being, um, I think that it's easier now than it used to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask, because first of all, that is, I think, incredible. And I hope that you celebrate that, that your team has been with you for that long. I think that we that's do. actually very, very rare in the industry, at least in Vancouver, it from is. what I've heard, it it's, is. it's very, very rare because because offices work like production houses and they 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 don't they objectify their staff. They don't care about them as people. They don't care about their families. They don't ask them. They don't care about their mental health. Um, you got to care about your people. They have to know you care. Mm -hmm. And we've had a couple of like my rock stars go out for a couple of months because of personal health issues. And uh, I never push them to know when they're coming back. I just sort my stuff out and talk to the clients and, you know, and make, but it's never been a problem. We just made it work, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it's because of the caliber of relationships we have in the office together today. Mm -hmm. And we didn't always have that. I had to do a lot of personal work to recognize that we needed that. Well, I was going to ask, like, what, what are some, of, what are some of the things that you've done or taken on or shifted as a leader in order to be able to foster an incredible culture and incredible loyalty? I've taken so many different like self development courses, some from, you know, from the wacky to, from, you know, from the wacky and kumbaya to the, to the, <laughs> you know, very like specific business stuff and um, all of it. I think like incrementally you, you take away things and start to connect dots. Um, Was there, is there anything that stands out in your mind that's um, a personal shift that maybe you've, you've encountered over the years? Yes, definitely. There's a couple. Like way back in the day, I did the whole Landmark um, series. And, you know, Landmark has its flaws, but it's a wonderful system in personal accountability. Yeah. And looking at your life and getting on with your stuff and getting out of the narrative. It's it's great. It's basic. It works. Um, and then today I, today, I have a spiritual practice, which has made a huge difference in my life um, in the last three years. So I cool. have a, yeah. Are you going to say more about that? Yeah, sure. Okay. Happy to. Yeah. I think you have to find a way to return to yourself. Yes. And the only way to return to yourself is to get really quiet. And um, so I, I practice this spiritual practice called, uh, it's in Vancouver called Spiritual Essentials. And I, I have, it's a meditation practice. It doesn't have, there's no deities or gods. It's really just about, they have a series of visualizations that you do and you get really quiet within yourself. And um, they give you some great methods for um, moving on from old stuff 
and manifestation. And I feel like, and my team feels like my leadership and it's gentle. You're not broken. You're coming back from a place of being whole and complete because we all are inside and so many pl uh, places thrive on your brokenness. Um, and so you find yourself as a leader in this state where you're like very, very broken. And then you're thinking, how the hell am I supposed to show up for my people when now I've like realized this thing from my past and, you know, those things are good, but they tend to be big and cathartic, whereas something that's meditation and a spiritual practice that's daily is moving things like like small gains every day for big gains. And I'd say since I started doing that, I've massively shifted just about everything. It is – I feel you so hard with what you're saying right now because I would echo that. So at this critical moment in my business, which happened in – uh, 2021. So that's when I started the downsize. And that was like 2020 um, was the year where the show had launched, COVID hit, the launch that I thought I was going to have didn't really happen the way like the press tour and all that mm -hmm. stuff didn't happen the way that thought it was going to. And the culture was really suffering and clients were unhappy. And I came to this moment where I had to have a moment of truth with myself and go, uh, what is going on here? Mm -hmm. I'm not happy, which was so hard for me to admit to myself and then started taking steps to change. And one of the things that I was incorporating in this time was a meditation practice. And I was doing journaling and yoga and meditation every morning. Great. And I swear that the meditation and the the practice of getting quiet and going inward has been completely transformative. And so that, I mean, I guess maybe it's been a, about two years that I've been doing that, but I would say the same thing. I think it's, I've evolved as a leader from doing that, um, got pregnant, stayed pregnant. And my, my meditation practice isn't as active now. I'm still trying to adjust with the sleep and waking up early yeah, with the eight your, month yeah. old. It's harder with children. <laughs> like it, it's, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough. But yeah. it's, it's an incredible thing. So I just feel you so hard when you're saying that and, and, um, having that spiritual practice and, and incorporating that into your own life makes you a better leader. Yeah. And like I've used some of the tools that I've learned in that practice, even in my leadership at the office, we have this thing now. Um, the, the practice I do has this wonderful teaching about resistance and ease. And so we all know when we're in resistance to something where, or like where you're like, you know, even a design just yesterday, we were, um, we've been working on this master bedroom for this home for like a week why are we working on something for a week, you know, and it, this bedroom, like the furnishings, they just weren't working. And so finally I said to Crystal, who's working on it with me, I said, you know what? Like, I know you love this element that you designed. We've got to throw it away. We've just got it like it were, it's, it's the thing you love the most. It's the thing you're most attached to. Let it go because I feel like it's just sticking us. And so we did, we threw it out. We pulled something else in and in 20 minutes we had the whole room finished and she just looks at me and she goes, ease. I'm like, right? <laughs> it's ease. Ease yeah. is everything. Yeah. Ease, you can be so much more prolific. You can have such easier relationships. So our our kind of um, litmus test is like with a, with a new client that's come in, with the design we're doing is like, does it have ease or does it have friction? Does it have, you know, it does it have Ooh, um, resistance? Yeah. And so it's like now it's, it's just part of our culture, the discussion of ease. Yeah. And um, the girls all have like a like a, a, a card on their behind their desk that says ease and that little description of our goals for that year. We chose that word a couple of years ago as our intention for the year, but it actually has stuck as something bigger in our culture today. And that came from my my teacher's teachings. Yeah. 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 Cause it doesn't always have to feel like I think in the early days of building a business, it feels like you're pushing a rock up a hill, right? Yeah, it's just sure. a boulder up a hill. But that can't be forever and it's certainly not sustainable. And I also think with your team, sure, there's weeks or months maybe where you're really grinding it out and you've got a number of deadlines that maybe you're juggling simultaneously. Oh, there's a difference between ease and easy. Yes. Right? Yes. There's nothing easy about doing design. There's nothing easy about running a business, but there can be ease in your creative flow. There can be ease in your relationships, even though you have to work at them, right? There's a difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. And I love that it you're bringing your own spiritual practice or elements of that, I guess, into yeah. your business and, make, and having that form part of the culture and the vocabulary that is inherent in your practice and your culture. I think that's very, very cool. I'm, I'm actually 
taking notes, mental notes here, because I think that's really smart and really wise to do that. It just helps me. I mean, it helps me lead. I really don't like, and, and I feel like in design, everyone gets confused to me in my mind about what a senior designer is. Everyone wants to get to a senior designer. And I, I've said to a couple of my team members, look, look, like you peek out at your, like your, your creative, that your creative potential will be there by your, by the point that you're intermediate. Your creative potential is not what defines you as a senior designer. It's your ability to handle the load. And the only thing that will allow you to handle the load, the client's emotions, the contractor's demands, like building your team members up, mentoring them at the same time and taking on whatever else you're taking on to contribute in the firm. The only thing is your ability to have bandwidth. And the only way that you can have built, like bandwidth is by having separation from everything. Mm -hmm. Like emotional, spiritual, psychological separation and realizing that deadline is not you, that person's emotions are not you. None of that is you, but we take it on like that. And so to me, senior on my team is the ability to have separation. Mm -hmm. And that's when they hit senior and that's mm -hmm. when I give them a senior salary. Yeah. 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 Because it's not about the work. It's not it about is, the work. but it's not. It is, but it's not. That's, that's very um, wise, I think, and astute of you to recognize that because I do think, and what I've witnessed in my own company is that's where a lot of burnout happens. Totally. And that's where there's the burnout happens and the, like having those boundaries, those healthy boundaries between what you're taking on with work and what's not work um, is also, I think, a, a skill and a muscle that people or designers need to learn and flex and probably need to be coached a little bit along the way. Yeah. Um, but it's really hard to, or I've at least had, have up until this point, have had a lot of difficulty mentoring and coaching around that because what I found is that when someone takes on more responsibility or they do get the title or they do get the promotion, sometimes the accountability or the responsibility can be crippling yeah. at that point because it is yeah. a lot. It's, it's a it, lot and they have to be ready for it and you also have to be there supporting them. And that's why I feel like my responsibility is to help my team members grow their bandwidth, which means you're also checking in with them on an emotional, spiritual level. Well, I was going to ask, so how much time do you spend doing those one-on-ones and coaching your Not team? Not enough. Not enough. Yeah. Yeah. I would like to have more time for that. Um, we try to do a monthly meeting. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. I try to like get one-on-one -on -one time with them. And just like yesterday I was out for lunch with one of my senior designers. Um, I try to get like touch-ins pretty much. I mean, I'm regularly talking to them, regularly touching in, yeah. but we only do like, we do one annual review. And I think it's more that I like try to have like a daily touch-in with them. Yeah. And like, I have this idea for next year that's going to require more of me that way. And I'm going to have to figure it out. Have you read any of Todd Henry's books? Mm -mm. Um, he wrote the book Hurting Tigers. Okay. So I just had him on the podcast and Hurting Tigers is a leadership book and it's all about leading creative teams specifically. Oh, that's cool. And he talks about the nuances that are inherent with creative work. So the thing is what makes creative work challenging to lead is that there are so many variables that you're constantly dealing with. Yes. And even though you might do the same project type, like Kelly Duck does beautiful estate homes, large scale homes, but every home has a unique set of parameters, a different budget, a different client. There's oh, yeah. timelines. Every, it's, it's bespoke. It's like, you know, you could be like a fashion house and do, you know, couture gowns, but every gown is going to be unique. Every gown. Exactly. Yeah. And so that, that, those nuances that are inherent with the type of work that we do makes it challenging to lead teams and set your team up for success because they also have to understand how to navigate those, those variables. Absolutely. And that's not easy to do. Not at all. Yeah. No, I I think like a creative business is one of the toughest business. Like I've had consultants in that have looked at my businesses and fr friends, you know, because when I went to EO, I had friends in tech, I had friends in all sorts of other industries. And that's the beauty of going to an organization like the entrepreneur's organization. They came in and they just said, wow, like this is a hard, hard business to run. You know, yeah. like the amount of energy you put in for the return financially is you, you could do other businesses and you would probably have more in the bank. For sure. Um, yeah. So you have to, you know, the intrinsic payback has to be in the quality of the work that you turn out and the quality of the relationships that you built. Mm -hmm. And you have to have a 
deep, deep passion, I think, for the work in order to be able to do this. Because if Absolutely. you don't, it's 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 not you almost happen. have to be like a little bit like like sick and compulsive. For <laughs> yeah, it. totally. <laughs> Like when designers hang out with designers and we talk about like transitions and like, you know, yeah, really nerdy, totally. like, wow, look at that transition. That's amazing. Yeah, you totally. know, like nerdy, nerdy talk and they're yeah. really psyched about it. You know, wow, did you see that fabric, that burnout's amazing, yeah. you know, and, and so you have to have a passion and love for it. You have You've to. Gotta, yeah. 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 How has having a daughter changed you as a business owner and a, a designer um, and how has that influenced your your work or the your working style? Oh, I mean, Icy is the best thing that ever happened to me. My daughter's name's Isolin, um, and she's five. Uh, she's just an awesome kid. I mean, it changed a lot. First of all, I had to get way more profit focused because I think I I I wanted to give her a, an incredible life, and I don't mean necessarily live in an extraordinary house and send her to private school. I mean, those things are nice, but I want to be able to have, have her travel. And that's really more important to me than anything, a lot of travel. And um, I, I want to just have the ease with which I can make those decisions. And so once I had Iceland, I like really took a hard look at how we were operating, you know, with the projects we were taking, what would it take to get our fee fees up, the value of our fees up. So actually having her really um, focused, laser focused me on what I wanted the company to become and why. And and also I obviously have to set way more personal, like way more boundaries on my time um, and so that I can be with her. And that is a constant work in progress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's something that's definitely new for me too is um, keeping meetings concise, uh, trying to get out the door, uh, yeah. you know, not, and when I go home, there isn't that opportunity to answer emails and work late anymore because I need to do bedtime and bath time and feeding and all of that stuff. Yeah. And then before you know it, the day's over and I'm like, okay, give me a glass of wine and I just want to wind down. Yes. <laughs> um, but I love that having your daughter seems like it was really inspiring and motivating. It was so motivating. I think it actually like reinvigorated my passion for my business, you know, cause you could easily go you could easily go one way or the other. I have friends that just, they're like, you know what? I just, I don't want to do this anymore. And that's how one of my, that's how my team turned over seven years ago. Four, four, three or four of my team all had babies. Mm -hmm. And then when they went to have their seconds, none of them came back. They were all with me for about seven years up to that point. And then they all left the industry. Nicole's the only one that stayed. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what turned our team last time. And a lot of people make that decision and I don't blame them. Mm -hmm. I don't blame them. It's a tough juggle. Yeah. But she helped me get focused and I do work very hard to spend a lot of quality time with her. Yeah. 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 Madison's been the same for me too. And even on days when if I am going to work and kind of feeling like, ugh, even that feeling, I don't want to role model that to my daughter. Like I want to be so in fierce alignment with myself and excited about what I'm doing that she can see – me as a role model and aspire to that. Like, I don't want to be grinding it out and yeah, have her see that. Absolutely. You, there's, and I think that that evolves too. Like, well, you have this little human in your life and you th start thinking, because you'll, you'll see them mimicking you as she gets older. You're going to see her do things like I used to like pack her bag and she, I'd be like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm going to work, mom. <laughs> and and you're um, like, mm, you're mm, four. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I was thinking, is that what I want her to think is the most important thing? Um, and we've been talking a lot about, uh, about she's five now, so there's some pretty cool conversations you can have. But yeah, you want to set a, an extraordinary example as both a mother and a leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Your humanity matters more than anything. For sure. For sure. Absolutely. Um, you have been doing such incredible work or definitely as an outsider looking in and seeing what you're posting on Instagram, the recent uh, piece that came out in Architectural Digest. It's pretty cool. Which is so cool. Yeah. Uh, I feel like that's that's almost what designers – that's like the, the publication that that's designers the pinnacle. aspire that's the to pinnacle. be in. It's like yeah. once you're in 
Architectural Digest, it's like, oh, this is big. It was a pretty big deal. Yeah. Yeah. It was a pretty big deal. Can you talk about that project a little bit? Yeah, it was a great project. So we had um, like a a beautiful home that we were doing for Kimberly and David Jones. And uh, I think the home turned out magnificently. It's a very kind of provincial looking home. It's very relaxed. Um, And they, Kim had a great vision. So she was a fun client to collaborate with. And then, and then she furnished the home and then, um, I brought my team in to do like the full, like photography styling and, you know, getting it like ready for that kind of big shoot. And I have like a pretty A team for that. I'm very blessed by that. And we just knew we had a shot at it, um, AD, like, let's all be honest, like, AD is amazing, but AD also like their part of their strategy is, is celebrity. So we knew that because David was, you know, NHL, that that would give us, a, that they would, it would at least get to, across someone's desk. Yeah. Right. Because so many designers do work that is AD worthy, but if you haven't got the story uh, and, and sometimes the art, in this case, the art didn't matter. They were okay with that. Um, but, you know, if you haven't got the, the story and if the story doesn't have some sort of celebrity element that will drive their readership, um, then they might pass you by. And so we just knew we had the formula that might work and it did. And it was extraordinary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Such a proud moment. It was a proud moment. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Well, um, I mean, you do, again, such incredible work. And I think that um, you really have created such a stamp and a Kelly Deck look. Thank you. And like I was saying earlier, your name really has become synonymous with West Coast design. Do you feel that? Well, you know, it's really funny. It's, it, it's interesting that it – because as I'm evolving my brand, I'm moving in – like I'm moving in a very tradition – I either do traditional homes, which I love – or if I take a modern project, it's a really high-end modern project because I think the, like in the middle for modern is just not for me. It's generally just – you can't do great details with $500 a square foot. Mm-hmm. Sorry. You just mm-hmm. can't. So mm-hmm. whereas traditional, you know, although it's that's all changed with inflation and stuff, but back in the day, yeah. which is only like, <laughs> you know, 18 months ago, yeah. um, <laughs> you, you could do some really lovely standout things with finishing carpentry um, at a lower price point and have like a really magnificent result. Whereas modern, if you want to do something really exceptional, you really need like the baselines much higher to get a high mm-hmm. quality result. So I only, I, I like just handpick those projects and I have an incredible team that does them. Um, but I think it's interesting because our style when people you know the book that just came out the west coast design book yes. have you seen that so we're in yes. that book yes and if you flip through there then it's like oh yeah contemporary 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 and yeah. kelly duck yeah right <laughs> yeah so, you know and there's cam's home and a couple other beautiful <laughs> homes we've done I, th- I threw a contemporary one in there just so that people would know we actually did yeah. do it um maybe but maybe it's like a like a traditional expression of west coast yeah. which is kind of cool yeah i like that yeah 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 well and when i think of kelly duck's work that is what I think about traditional homes, masterfully executed, very timeless with a little bit of a modern spin. Yeah. I think you always want the room to have like a piece of today. Yeah. And like I, I love- They're like, not stuffy homes. Not at all. No. Not at all. No, they're not. They're, they're not at all. But I like I really love decor. I get a, a great deal of joy of decor and you can do so much more of it inside of a traditional home yes, than you, you can in a modern home. Yes. So I really enjoy that. And- yeah, no, I think that it should always look fresh. Yeah. Like this product line, this elusive product line we're working on right now, <laughs> that's actually, that, that's that been the balance we've been trying to strike is making sure that it doesn't look old fashioned. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. West Coast North is the name of the book. Kelly Deck is featured in that book. House of Bond also has work featured in that book. Uh, I haven't talked about that on the podcast yet. I don't even know if Ken... Uh, viewers or listeners buy that book? I think it's out now. It's out now? I think so. Or if we it's sh- not, it's, it's it's like in a very short period of time. Okay. It was, we'll it was we'll meant get you guys the, a link. The Christmas market. Yeah. We'll yeah. get you guys a link. So it'll be in the show notes. It's a beautiful or, book. It's a beautiful book. It features designer, interior designers um, all across the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Um, there's a number of designers in there. It is a really beautiful coffee table book. It yeah. is. It is. And it really shows the breadth of talent that is on the West Coast. Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. But For I'd sure. be curious, like, are we still what people see as the epitome of West Coast design? Maybe. I, I like, I'm doing more and more work on, on the East Coast now too, which is interesting. interesting. Yeah. I'm starting a project in New York. I fly out on Friday. Yeah. 
amazing, amazing Cape Dutch style home. There's only a few of them in America. So it's in the historical archives. I'm so excited. Yeah. Um, and then we have a home in New Orleans as well. So it's interesting because we're actually attracting some East Coast work too. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't surprise me though, because I feel like the traditional aesthetic mm -hmm. works really well on the East Coast. Well, they're very, they're very at ease with it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, Kelly, thank you so much for coming on the show. I found this discussion to be really inspiring and it was just so fun to jam with you and another interior designer and also to hear a little bit about the inner workings of your company and just to, to, to hear about how far and how much you've grown. Um, definitely, I, I found a lot of this conversation really inspiring. I'm sure that the audience and the listeners will as well. And um, I just want to thank you again for taking the time to share a little bit about your story. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure. I was really honored to be invited. Thanks so much for listening and watching this episode. For more conversations like this, you can find them basically on all podcast platforms. Make sure you leave us a review because that really helps us get the show out there. And follow me on Instagram at Karen Bond. I always love hearing from you guys and learning what really resonated for you about these episodes. So when you leave me a note, make sure you tag myself and the guest. Until next time, thanks so much for watching. Love you guys and we'll see you in the next episode.